On Long Island's North Shore sits a house, a very unique one. Its owner was an author, vice president, governor, war hero, conservationist, president, and much, much more. A frail young Theodore Roosevelt first came to Oyster Bay in the summer of 1873. His family lived in a rented summer house, Tranquility. Young Theodore was fascinated by the plant and bird life and used the environment to build his body with much rowing, hiking, and riding. On his 22nd birthday, he married Miss Alice Lee, and he soon purchased 155 acres of land in Oyster Bay. But his plans grinded to a halt in February 1884, when his wife died hours after the birth of their child, Alice. Roosevelt spent the next years of his life in the badlands of North Dakota, where he ranched and wrote. In November 1886, Roosevelt sailed for England, where he married a childhood friend, Edith Corot. She came to Sagamore Hill in the spring of 1887 and filled the house with happiness and children. Daughter Ethel Roosevelt Derby, who still lives in Oyster Bay, will point out items of interest as this film progresses. The piazza is where T.R. and Edith would sit down at sunset and watch the lights from the riverboats on Long Island Sound. On the piazza, T.R. received word of his nomination of Governor of New York, Vice President, and President. T.R. hosted many groups here, from women suffragists to troops of Boy Scouts. I wish to see you boys act as good citizens in the same way I'd expect any one of you to act in a football game. In other words, don't flinch, don't fall, and hit the line hard. The library on the first floor was a room that was important to T.R. Here at his desk he wrote, handled affairs of state, entertained visitors from all walks of life, and read. The silver candlestick brings back memories of the Russo-Japanese war which my father was asked to arbitrate. The delegates met here in 1905, and when the Treaty of Peace was finally signed at Portsmouth, New Hampshire, that candlestick was used in sealing it, and for this treaty my father was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Represented here are two items Mrs. Roosevelt detested, the rhinoceros foot inkwell and the telephone. Much to her dismay, the telephone had to be connected when her husband became president. Books were very much a part of this home and the Roosevelt's lives. He himself wrote over 50 books, ranging from the Deer family to the Naval War of 1812. T.R. was devoted to Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln was a definite influence on T.R.'s life and political career. The man was also a great collector. He had one of the largest private collections of wild game in the country. Each item he collected had a particular significance. For example, this mosaic tile piece, a gift from Pope Leo XIII. I can remember my father looking up at the portrait of my grandfather, Theodore Roosevelt, and saying, he was the best man I ever knew. Roosevelt was a man who kept his promises, so if he told his children he would play with them at 4 o'clock, he did just that, and often left a cabinet member or diplomat behind in the library. The children regarded him as another playmate. With stopwatch in hand, he would time the children as they'd romp through a wild obstacle course in the barn. T.R. would drive his secret service men frantic with worry when he and several boats loaded with children would escape to an all-night's camp out at Lloyd's Neck. He would cook a dinner of beefsteak and sliced potatoes and then tell colorful stories of ghosts and cowboys and Indians to an attentive young audience. The drawing room very much reflects the taste and elegance of Mrs. Roosevelt. 
It was here that Edith and her friends would sit down to afternoon tea. Edith wasn't very fond of stuffed animals, but she made an exception with this white bearskin, a gift from Admiral Perry on his return from the North Pole. She preferred classical literature over the specialized scientific works and biographies her husband enjoyed. Edith wrote her mother and sister in Europe weekly. She kept them well informed of the busy, vibrant family of Sagamore Hill. With six children, Edith's days were full ones, reading, teaching, sewing, companionship, and just being a good mother. She never seemed to raise her voice or give an order, but no one thought for a moment she wasn't alert to what was going on. Distinguished guests were served tea elsewhere in the house as well. And one of the most distinguished guests was Clara Dahl. She'd been in Mrs. Roosevelt's family for years, and Edith really treasured her. All the children save Alice spent some time in the nursery. Both parents combined intuition and understanding in raising their children, and each child was respected as an individual. Truthfulness was expected from the children. Be quicker with the truth, their father would exclaim. All the Roosevelt boys occupied this room at some time, but young Archie remained here the longest. Both parents believed in treating their children as equals and allowed each child to form his own judgments and opinions. They gave the children all the freedom they could safely deal with. The naval pictures on the wall remind one that T.R. was once Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and as President, he molded the U.S. Navy into one of the strongest sea forces in the world. In 1907, T.R. sent 16 battleships around the world to prove to many nations, and particularly Japan, the strength of the United States. The room is filled with many reminders of the boy's famous father. The children loved and worshipped him. They were convinced that no one could ride better, shoot straighter, chop down a tree better, or row a boat quite like their father. The children got down to the serious business of reading, writing, and arithmetic in this schoolroom on the third floor. At this stage of our career, our lessons were conducted by a wonderful English governess, Miss Young. But both then and later, when we had more advanced studies, Father used to help when we had problems with our schoolwork. He had such an enormous background of information and such an ability to cover a subject succinctly and graphically that in no time at all we absorbed enough to get us over any difficulties we had. When this elephant tusk gong sounded, the children knew that meals were served. The bunnies, as T.R. affectionately called his children, had ten minutes leeway in which they scurried down to their places. If there were more than ten minutes in getting to the table, they ate their meal one hour later. Furniture in the dining room was purchased by the Roosevelts during their honeymoon in Florence, Italy. The round silver bowl to the right on the sideboard was given my father by the so-called tennis cabinet, a term applied to him and his cabinet officers, because they were for the most part young and active, and they played tennis and they rolled and they walked together. You see, he was in his early forties when he went to the White House. We weren't a quiet family. There was a great deal of conversation at the table. Everyone was interested to hear what the others had been doing and were planning. So I remember it as a happy time, even breakfast. It was quite commonplace for the children to sit down to a meal along with cabinet members, generals, writers, and foreign ambassadors. Although the table talk was often over the children's heads, the sparkle of it was not lost to them. Directly off the dining room sits the pantry. Sugar, flour, and other staples were stored here.
Edith Roosevelt ran the family finances, and she logged everything down in this account book. In the year 1905, the Roosevelt's fuel and light bill was $140. The cook earned a wage of $35 a month. The butler, $128 for the year. This was always a sunny, welcoming kitchen, and when we were little, we always used to come here and sit at that little table over there to your right for tea and toast and jam. The kitchen was filled with many of the modern conveniences of the day, such as this meat grinder and knife sharpener. That marvelous old range is a coal stove, of course, and on the shelf over it is a great tin that held the bread, which was baked fresh each day, and this was a real part of our family life. Meals were simple but plentiful. T.R. was in no sense a gourmet, but he was a very hearty eater. In fact, eating was one of his few forms of self-indulgence. But he burned off many calories by living the strenuous life he preached, with much hiking, riding, and chopping, which he considered sport, not a chore. Although its northwest position rendered this one of the coldest rooms in the house, the Roosevelts chose this as their master bedroom for the beautiful view of Oyster Bay and Connecticut beyond. This incredible furniture was purchased by T.R.'s father some 100 years ago. And it was in this room that we used to celebrate the beginnings of Christmas. We all used to wake up very early and had to wait around until 7 or 7.30. And then we'd all come in here and the fire would be blazing and we'd take down our stockings from that rather small fireplace and go and sit on the bed and open them. Right off the master bedroom sits the dressing room. As a horseman, T.R. could more than hold his own, whether in following the hounds, playing polo at Sagamore Hill, or the rough and tumble of a roundup at the ranch. T.R. posed in this cape for his famous Philip de Laszlo portrait. Since there were some 30 Roosevelts living in Oyster Bay at the time, Mrs. Roosevelt embroidered R of S, Roosevelt of Sagamore, on a linen so that the laundress in town knew what to return and where. This room shows many of the original illustrations used for his books, Ranch Life and the Hunting Trail and Hunting Trips of a Ranchman, which are most delightful books. And he loved these illustrations, many of them by Frost. Mm. The Old West is still very much alive in the gun room, on the third floor. Here, he would retreat to a battered chair and read contentedly for hours. T.R. read at least two books daily and retained much with his near photo, hardly a subject he wasn't well informed about. to crowd in here whenever we could, and my father told us a great many stories here, hunting stories and all that. And he had a great many stories to tell, because he was quite a hunter. Many of the animals mounted on the walls of Sagamore Hill were not shot for sport, but for food. The man was considered an authority on the habits of big game animals, and was regarded as one of the top field naturalists in the country. The pistol at the top of this gun case was used by Colonel Theodore Roosevelt in the Spanish-American War. And he was the first president to take conservation seriously. He set up many wild game preserves and converted vast amounts of public land into national forests. In a letter to daughter Ethel in 1906, 
TR sums up his feelings about Sagamore Hill. After all, fond as I am of the White House, and much though I have appreciated these years in it, there isn't any place in the world like Sagamore Hill, where things are our own, with our associations, and where it's real country.